Welcome back to Man Who Tried to Fake an Element by Bobby Broccoli. This is part three. Let's continue. Just a few minutes after the phone call, Gregorich, a visiting professor named Walter Loveland, and Viktor Ninov had come to her office. Ninov had found something incredible in the early results. Notably, Ninov didn't want to show Darlene the results at first, but he was outvoted because why wouldn't you? To better illustrate what he had observed, Ninov drew his colleagues this diagram, picture-perfect alpha decay chains that ended in element 106. Interesting, that's... is that 118? <laughs> if this was legit, the team had found not just 118, but 116 and 114 as well. With the IUPAC decision still out on 114, this was two, potentially three new elements that belonged to Berkeley. That's cool, going in one fell swoop, um, as they discussed in the previous part, just combining uh, heavier elements by bombarding them and then eventually just decaying so you can kind of cheat ahead because, hey, the alpha decay will take care of itself, so you'll discover a bunch of new elements. <laughs> Interesting way of thinking. Their first in 25 years. Darlene Hoffman was going to get her wish three times over. Ninov, in as much disbelief as everyone else, jokingly asked, does Robert talk to God? Now they didn't immediately announce to the world their finding. They took a few weeks and ran another experiment, and one more alpha decay chain was found. Of the four they had now, the team reasoned that one may be a fluke, but that the other three were legit. Not only that, they sent the results to okay. GSI. They also gave the green light. In June 1999, Hoffman and Giorso, two titans of the element hunt, held a press conference and announced their two new elements. The eventual paper was submitted to physical review letters on May 25th, 1999. Everyone from the semi-retired Giorso to the fresh-faced grad students got to be on it. Viktor Ninov was first author. Given how successful hmm. Robert's recipe had been, Ken Gregorich thought that the next logical step was to simply swap out the lead target for bismuth. With that extra proton, maybe they could find element 119. Now make no mistake, if an element was going to be named after someone in the group, it wasn't going to be Ninov. The obvious choice, the one already being thrown around, was Georgium. Al was the mm. current world record holder and the only person who had a legacy comparable to his late friend Seaborg. But Ninov clearly had a bright future ahead of him. With potentially five elements under his belt, he was clearly ready to carry the torch. I've heard some people mention to me about like, what's the real practical use of finding all of these super heavies? And for one, we, we use some of them. I mean, plutonium is a classic example and americium for being used in smoke detectors. So just new materials that have properties that, that we can use. And like americium is, ex is super expensive relative to uranium and plutonium, but you don't need a lot of it to make a smoke detector. We're talking 0.3 micrograms. So at $1,000 a gram, that's, you know, it's affordable to make a smoke detector. Another thing is just from more of a physics perspective, it gives us a greater understanding of how nuclei are held together. So this big little ocean that um, Bobby Broccoli made, which I think is super, super cool, uh, the fact of finding these islands and seas just gives us a greater understanding of how these nuclei are held together, which could eventually lead us to develop more efficient nuclear power plants because our understanding of how nuclei work would, would be better. We've learned so much more since discovering these super heavies about how to make, about how to make nuclear power plants. There's a reason why all the, a lot of these heavy elements were discovered, uh, such, as, such as uranium, neptunium, plutonium, were discovered before commercial nuclear power even really took off back in the 1940s. It's, it's all about paving it forward and uh, future investment. He didn't get to carry it for long. GSI, missing their star researcher but still on top of their game, were eager to get caught up with Berkeley. However, when they took a crack at repeating Robert's magical recipe, they didn't see the alpha decay chain that Ninov had recorded. Similarly, before the end of 1999, teams in France and Japan also came up blank. This was mm. very odd, as all those labs had tried their best to replicate the Berkeley conditions as closely as possible. Robert's recipe was thought to be a long shot, yes, but the benefit of it was it was low risk with a potentially high reward. That is one key thing about any scientific discoveries. It needs to be repeatable uh, just to... It's not just about bias or necessarily questioning someone's integrity, but just so it can be practical. If it only 
happened a fluke or the probability was so low, and we've already talked a lot about probability in this uh, video, did you really do it? Or, is, or it's kind of raises the question, is there a better way to do it? The two recipe ingredients were comparatively easy to acquire and set up. Something was off. Nino was doing the conference circuit at this time and, again, was bizarrely <laughs> reluctant to talk about yeah. his breakthrough. He continually deflected questions about his potentially career-defining discovery. The Berkeley team is perplexed at this point. They rerun their own experiment in spring of 2000. They can't reproduce the event either. This is a problem now. Assuming the same conditions, the second run in 2000 should have produced around three more atoms of 118. By summer 2000, Berkeley established an independent team to rerun the same experiment under the supervision of Ai Yang Li. Completely different team of people, but the same lab and conditions. His studies wrap up by fall 2000. They too saw no evidence of the 118 decay chain. Mm -hmm. Following this, Berkeley overhauls their detector system and clamps down on their operation procedures. We're talking checking the purity of the helium gas, the resistance of the coils, everything you can think of. They even considered whether their beam was actually made. Make sure of everything's it. plugged in, sure. <laughs> and not contaminated by some other element. It was in fact entirely krypton, but by this point you couldn't take anything for granted. The year 2000 came and went with not a single hint of 118. By April 2001, they're ready to begin testing their new setup. By Love May, the emojis. finally, they got what they are hoping for another detection of 118. There was only one single alpha decay chain detected, and the reporter, once again, was Viktor Ninov. Now mm -hmm. in 1999, Ninov had been the only person to analyze the data, as he was the only one familiar with the Goosey analysis program he had brought over from Germany. But since then, it had been over two years, and several people had taught themselves Goosey as well. A postdoc named Don Peterson was among them. He and Ninov would run the program on the exact same data, and yet come up with completely different results. Don's results said 118 wasn't there. The dread had set in. Mm. Berkeley by this point knows it's in hot water and meticulously documents every single step from here on out, with multiple rounds of bureaucracy, which I have to imagine is for legal reasons as much as it is for technical reasons. Is there a reason why there's no photo of Donald Peterson there? Or maybe he's just not available? In June 2001, Darlene Hoffman assembles a working group to comb through every bit of data relating to the detection of 118. They are going to sift through every raw data file as far back as 1999. This working group, based on their findings, leads to a new independent review committee, which then leads to a third committee, and then a fourth, the last of which has the official where this is going. committee for the formal investigation of alleged Ooh. scientific misconduct. Over the course of three committees, the investigation had gone from, why aren't we able to repeat the experiment? To, okay, someone is getting fired. A big thank you to Kit Chapman for providing me with nearly 200 pages from Berkeley's internal investigation, which he obtained thanks to California's Public Records Act. As you can imagine, the three committees cover a lot of the same ground, so I'll be summarizing their main arguments into three categories. One, statistical. What is the likelihood that these measurements were genuine? Two, technical. Is there evidence that the raw data was tampered with, either intentionally or by accident? That's the real thing, and that that would be the killer. Because it, it could be just something that was super low probability and an honest thing that happened, but if things were tampered with, then, then you get into the punitive committees. Three, identity. If anyone, who is to blame? We'll start with statistics. When the other labs attempted to verify the Berkeley results, they found nothing. This was odd because those labs actually had better beam setups. They had a higher chance of producing 118 than Berkeley. Berkeley was capped at 1.6 times 10 to the 18 krypton ions. GSI and RIKEN had a combined total of 4.9 times 10 to the 18, which is nearly three times as many. Okay. If you interpret that statistic in the most generous way possible, that's like being able to spin the roulette wheel three times as much. Together, they should have seen around three times as many atoms of 118. Again, just like a roulette wheel, this doesn't mean it can't happen, just that it's statistically unlikely. True. And granted, three times when you're talking some of that isn't necessarily massive compared to like 10 times, 100 times. But again, you're talking about law of nar large numbers. If you're dealing with something that's another thing multiplied times 10 to the 18th, you would think you, you would have a uh, similar-ish distribution, just kind of a bit just a more pronounced curve from all of those repeated trials. Because some Monte Carlo simulations are just on the order of 
thousands to millions of uh of trials if you think about it as you know just darts on the dartboard or roulette wheels like like he said usually you can you're when you're dealing with two very large numbers right here you would think they would kind of follow each other the physicist hk schmidt ran an analysis on the decay chains from an earlier study of element 110 and then compared that to the data from 118. It's important to remember that an element's half-life is a statistical quantity. If you measure just a single atom of a radioactive sample, it will decay after a completely random amount of time. It could be a microsecond, it could be minutes. You need to analyze many atoms and then plot those decay times on a probability distribution. An ideal distribution would see many very short decays and fewer and fewer long decays. So what's interesting, uh, there is... There's a, there's a thing about Half-Life that comes up, and I've heard this one before, since everything just decreases by half, does that mean it ever really goes away? Well, well, that's correct, technically, but usually, uh, at least within, for, for radiation protection purposes, seven to ten Half-Lives, you say it's gone. Because at seven, you're less than one percent, seven Half-Lives, and at 10 trace amounts, unless you're dealing with something crazy, crazy hot, but nothing we've ever really worked with in the nuclear plant gets like that. You have to try to do something on, on purpose, but when it turns to things like fission products or things that were activated in a reactor, at 10 you're gone. Data for element 110 agrees with this behavior. When the same test is applied to the three atoms shown in the element 118 paper, they rise up sharply, with most decays clumping in the middle of the graph. This data isn't physical. This is goofy. Three more Berkeley team members privately perform statistical analyses of their own, and out of one million random trials, only 0.82% of them gave decay distributions that matched the 118 data. There was almost no chance this data was real. Next, the technical argument. The program used to detect the decay events was called Goosey. Goosey was known to be unreliable at times. Mm, okay. It would occasionally glitch, and data could be corrupted <laughs> in the shared memory database. This corruption could manifest as incorrect histograms, misaligned array indices, or truncated arrays. The problems were frequent enough that an aura of superstition had arisen around Goosey. It took someone experienced with the program to even realize that Goosey had glitched in the first place. I guess you could say they're going on a wild goose chase. All right, I'm done. Much less decipher what it had really measured. But what they were seeing in the data was too perfect to be a glitch. To quote the New York Times, it was as though Microsoft Word had crashed, and like the proverbial monkeys banging away on typewriters, tossed off sentences from Shakespeare. <laughs> the idea that Goosey had crashed and dozens of lines of measurements had perfectly corrupted to give five pristine alpha decay chains was absurd. I did a reaction to a Kurtzgazat video that talked about this, but here you're talking about nearly infinite timelines and way into heat death of the universe time period for the probability of monkeys basically writing the complete works of Shakespeare. If you want to hear more about that kind of stuff, I'll pin it in a comment down below. I highly encourage you to check that out if you're into that. Talking time measurements, energy measurements, location measurements, all syncing up to give not just one rogue decay chain, but five. Ooh, up to With five, five now. Ruled out, the only remaining explanation was that the raw data files were manipulated in some way. Whether intentional or accidental, something had happened to the data files that wasn't random. That's another thing that could tell you how much trouble you're getting in, if it was intentional or negligent. You're still going to get in trouble for negligent, but it's typically not nearly as much. The investigation became hyper-focused on the events that originally showed 118. In 1999, there were two runs of interest. Run 13, which was from April 8th to the 12th, detected three alpha decay chains. Two of those made it into the published paper. A couple weeks later, run 15, from April 30th to May 5th, also detected an alpha decay chain, which also made it into the paper. And finally, in 2001, there was run 45 from April to May 2001, which showed just a single alpha decay chain. The committee determined hmm. by checking the relevant system log files that all the data from these runs was in fact original. The raw cassettes had not been altered. That being said, the original data tape that should contain run 45 was missing. There is no explanation for where this tape went could be intentional or an accident. 
Fortunately, a disk file was found that was believed to contain an exact copy of Run 45, and this disk copy was analyzed as well. Did I mention I love Bobby Broccoli's little neon little images, like the little tape and the CD? That just adds to the flavor. This presentation style is excellent. The committee took these raw data files and used Goosey to analyze them all. No hits for element 118 were found. Now that is really odd. This is the original data, and there are no signs of 118. Their next step was to look even deeper into the log files. Goosey outputs a massive running log where a bunch of data is grouped in columns like this. The leftmost column is time. Each line is considered a separate event, which is when the detector receives an energy reading from somewhere. We're working with extremely fast physical phenomena, so there could be dozens of events in a single second. Yeah, so what is that? Is that like hours, minutes, or are we talking seconds and uh, I guess hundreds of a second? Looks, looks like hours and minutes to me. This looks very much like an old school uh, plant computer that, like a uh, like a reactor trip log. After a reactor is emergency shut down, that it spits off, like say, okay, control rods for oh, fully inserted. Uh, reactor reactor power initial reactor power was this. Temperature was this. Pressure was this, and then it spits out uh, continuously as it goes down. You can zoom in um, pretty far pretty far down to fractions of a second to uh, get a sense of that. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, but yes, every time you have a reactor trip or an, an emergency shutdown, this, this document needs to be reviewed by a position called the uh, shift technical advisor. Think of it as a nuclear engineer that's on shift. I, I, had that, I did that job for a few years. They review that and as well as and then this goes to a investigation committee that determines, okay, we figured out what the cause of the trip was. We've repaired these systems. If it turned out to, if something was in need of repair and everything responded as it should have, so we can go ahead and restart. And if something didn't respond as it should have, a bunch of corrective action tasks get created. And then we, um, it gets investigated to correct those before starting up a nuclear plant. Probably one of the biggest, um, and for, for good reason, you want to make sure everything can work safely uh, bef before you start up any large facility, a nuclear power plant included. It's just w one of the many checks that is done before restarting. Take a look at this. This is the log file from 2001. This block of events here were supposedly a string of three alpha particle decays. You can tell because the location where they hit the detector are all quite close together, and their energy readings match predictions for 118. However, they checked much later in the log file after Goosey had been run multiple times, and these perfect numbers were no longer there. Huh. The signs of tampering are completely invisible unless someone is extremely experienced with Goosey. A printout from Goosey will hmm. typically contain somewhere between 63 to 68 lines of text. During the investigation, there were five exceptions to this. One of those exceptions was the detection of 118, which was 76 lines long, almost as if extra lines had been added to the readout somehow. The event at 1254 states that a 200 megabyte file was read and analyzed in five seconds. However, the computer Goosey runs on would not be capable of processing a file at 40 megabytes per second. The I was gonna say, were things that seemed pretty fast for 2000, 2001, or 1999 time period. <laughs> I, remember 200 me I remember when 200 megabytes seemed like a lot. The only explanation is that a file wasn't actually being analyzed. If you look at the second column for the event at 1254, you see two dashes. The following event, 1503, shows a dollar sign and then an A&L. The committee noted that two dashes only appear in the second column when a command is run to type the contents of another file into the log file. So, say someone takes the raw data, runs it through Goosey for analysis. Goosey then outputs a bunch of analyzed data. That text is then copy-pasted into a text editor, and the text is manually altered line by line until the numbers show what appear to be a perfect alpha decay chain. This text is then saved to a file, a command is run in Goosey, as indicated by the two dashes, which overwrites Goosey's log file to show the amazing evidence of a new element. So the 2001 log file had clear evidence of tampering. But what about 1999? 
Well, it turns out they had just been looking in the wrong place. The log files all showed the correct outputs, but when you compared those tables to those that made it into the published paper, there were some major differences. Energy values and time values were altered, some entirely new events were added, values wow. tweaked just enough to suggest alpha decay chains. The entire fundamental basis for the paper was made up. It didn't match the data from Goosey. This blatant manipulation could occur if, say, only one person had actually seen the Crazy. original log files, and that person just so happened to be the first author on the paper. Wow, so everyone else sees and no one knows, so he's just in, on an island doing this thing and all these other authors aren't even aware of it. I wonder if anyone other than Ninoff got in trouble over this. Let's find out. The committee later found that every suspicious log file belonged to the same user account. V. Ninov. Mm. Argument 3. Identity. You would think at this point it's an open and shut case, that the user account name settles the argument as to who exactly tampered with the log files, but Berkeley had to cover their bases. Throughout the course of the investigation, as more and more signs pointed to Ninov as the culprit, he was placed on paid administrative leave. He also mm. hired legal counsel. He wasn't going down without a fight. Even without the smoking gun of the user account name, there were plenty of indications that Ninov's involvement in the project wasn't entirely above board. When they submitted the paper, the original data had only been analyzed three times, all by Ninov. When the committee went digging for the raw data, they discovered that basically no electronic copies of it existed, and that the only record of a detection of 118 was on two hand-drawn pieces of paper from Ninov. That's sketchy, even for back then. <laughs> wow. And yet no one had double-checked where any of these numbers came from. Later- For all, it's kind of like even, could have even just checked to see, checked the math just to make sure like the decay numbers even make sense for alpha decay, but if no one's even seen it. When one of the committees asked Ninov to reproduce figure two in the paper, Ninov was able to produce approximate versions of A, B, and C but he was unable to reproduce figure D using any analysis program, instead saying that he had originally made it by hand. Interesting that of these four graphs, only one of these would be easy to generate by hand. Ninov maintained his innocence throughout the entire investigation. Ninov was specifically asked by the committee whether he thought Goosey could have corrupted the data. His answer was no. Instead, he offered multiple versions of a bizarre conspiracy. At first, Ninov argued really? that someone else at the Berkeley lab must be jealous that the element hunting team was getting so much time with the beam and thus resorted to sabotage. Interesting, he, I, I find it interesting that he said that, because that, that that's a fair out, that yeah, if it's a weird program, even for back then, that yeah, if it messed with up the data, but wow. Later, Ninov changed his story and argued that after the initial reports of other labs failing to reproduce the results, someone on the team must have gotten cold feet and retroactively removed the decay chain from the original data. Changing your story is, that's, that's when the firings happen almost, almost immediately. I've observed any, involved in any human performance event, even ones that weren't uh, fraudulent, but when someone changes their story, implies a, la a, a lack of intent, integrity then yeah you know some you know and uh, you usually have enough evidence at that point to know some sketchy stuff is going down finally <laughs> putting aside sabotage and putting aside someone getting cold feet victor ninov argued that everyone in the lab technically had access to the account v ninov his account password was apparently an open secret someone else could have easily used his account and any blame would fall on him the committee found that, yes, wow. this was possible. Other members of the lab did have access to his files. The problem with this argument, then, is how did a Goosey expert like Ninov not notice any alterations when they eventually reviewed the data? Similarly, in October 2001, Berkeley submitted a retraction of their paper to physical review letters. Hello, please disregard this paper. Thank you. Mm. ...all declines to retract the paper. Their cited reason is that Viktor Ninov refused to sign off on the retraction. So again, if he believes he's been duped or framed, why would he refuse to sign off on a retraction? Ninov only attended one face-to-face yeah. -face interview on December 14th of 2001 and declined two later invitations. His later statements were written answers to provided questions, presumably after he consulted with his legal team. Despite this, some of Ninov's responses verge on outright petty. He claims that several figures in the report by Ai Yang Li are off by orders of magnitude. 
as a way to discredit them. Mm. There's nothing wrong with these figures. They just happen to be based off of Robert's magic recipe, which was well known to disagree with most of the existing scientific literature. And he spends a whole paragraph saying that the committee's focus on the failings of Goosey is comparable to, and I quote here, debates about the superiority of Windows versus Unix or Word versus WordPerfect. <laughs> oh, I barely remember WordPerfect. That, that's crazy. I guess it would be like saying, com comparing, you know, iPhones and Androids today or something like that, but crazy. Sure, man. With his back against the wall, Ninov turned on his friends. Whatever friendships they had with Ninov beforehand were destroyed. They wanted nothing to do with him now. The hammer came down quick. Ninov was placed on administrative leave on November 21st, 2001, a week before the misconduct investigation began. He was officially fired in May of 2002. After being fired, he filed a grievance with the University of California, Berkeley, of course he did. but nothing ever came of this. The paper was finally retracted after nearly an entire year. None of his co-authors were implicated in the fraud, although that didn't stop the committee from having a few harsh words for them. They homed in on what they saw as a shocking weak link in the scientific review process, relying on only a single person, Ninov, for the analysis that underpinned the entire claim of Element 118. Yep, everything should get peer reviewed. That could potentially lead to safety issues depending on if it was a thing. I know all engineering calculations for a nuclear plant are required to have at least one peer review, and in some cases, and that's just documented peer review, not the whole informal, hey, can you make sure I did this right or use this particular type of program or whatever, or reproduce it some, some different way, a formal peer review where the reviewer is... Let me put it this way, if, if, if a mistake is discovered, it's the reviewer is actually under even more scrutiny than the initial preparer of, of the calculation. And there's all, it also requires a uh, manager's approval. Now, the manager typically doesn't check the math, but it checks and evaluates the results kind of t and um, also looks at the looks at what the implications are and, you know, to ultimately make a uh, decision on it, whether if it's a design choice or a maintenance scheduling choice, depending on the type of calculation that goes on at the plant. But there is a more arduous uh, review process for sure. Yes, Ninov was the sole expert at Goosey, but that still didn't prevent anyone from looking at the raw data files. Part of the issue here may stem from the management hierarchy. The experiment was essentially co-led, with Ken Gregorich leading the machining side and Ninov leading the analysis side. As such, he was able to avoid scrutiny. And finally, the lab as a whole was criticized for a stunning lack of documentation, especially for the breakthroughs in 1999, which as we know now, were recorded entirely on just two pieces of paper. That's the part that's just crazy, because usually results are documented, repeated, often within the same lab before you make any sort of claim that you've found something new or some new other ways you want to share it. You want because you know a good you you would want it to get confirmed one for no other reason, just for being excited. And obviously, it's good science, good scientific method to have repeatable results in different labs. Heinz Gagler was a friend of Ninov's when they both worked at GSI. Ninov would often crash at his house when they went on hiking trips. Victor was so well received when he came to Berkeley. He had full support. And because of that, one didn't look too carefully into the analysis he was doing. It was a total disaster. Did it destroy hmm. Berkeley? Of course it did. Berkeley was Berkeley. The outside wow. world doesn't want fake news. The show was over. Interesting hearing them use the term fake news uh, from back then. Ken Gregorich prefers not to talk about the scandal at all. It was a dark period, and it's gone, and I'd rather leave it at that. It's a similar case for Darlene Hoffman. She never got her element. Mm. For those at the top, it's mortifying to have such a blatant case of fraud occur under your watch. And on the other hand, you have a handful of 20-something grad students whose names made it onto that paper. Even if you had just a single shift running the cyclotron during the experiments, your name got on the paper. You had nowhere near enough knowledge or responsibility to even consider fraud as a possibility. That is one thing that happens within the nuclear power industry too. Like everything is logged. There's uh, shift stamps. Uh, anyone who works the shift, say during a reactor startup ish, and not not just starting up the reactor, but the rest, the secondary plant to bring the plant online and everything. Everyone's name from the 
from the plant general manager all the way down to plant operators has names, signatures on the uh, document everywhere within the process. There's several hundred involved per, per startup. And so, yeah, <laughs> everything's captured. Now, at the very start of your professional career, your name will permanently be part of a retracted paper. Suddenly, your resume goes from being a golden ticket yeah. in any lab you want to a radioactive warning sign. To I like that. <laughs> Good use of the word radioactive when it comes to uh, hiring. Radioactive is and nobody's going to want to hire you. <laughs> Don't really use that term in the nuclear industry just because it could be confusing, but that, that is a real term when it comes to uh, hiring and resumes and that sort of thing. It would be better to just erase two years from your career history. And the damage wasn't entirely contained to Berkeley. Sigurd Hoffman had been Ninov's boss at GSI. Elements 110 to 112 had been verified by other labs at this point. The data used in GSI's initial publication held up under scrutiny. Their elements were legit. And yet... They also used Goosey in their lab, and Ninov had been their Goosey expert. Wow. Sigurd recalls one day when they were searching for 112. Ninov still worked there, and early on, only a week into the experiments, Ninov said he found something. Sigurd immediately asked to see a printout of his findings, all the raw data, but Ninov said he was busy. He'd do it after lunch. A bizarre thing to say when you may have just found a new element. The printout wouldn't have been time yeah. consuming, it should have just been instant. And yet it took all day for Ninov to get around to it and show it to Sigurd. That's suspicious. When Sigurd saw it, he was confused. It was missing data and it didn't quite look like a decay chain. He told Ninov it wasn't good enough and they'd have to wait for more data. He didn't think much of it at the time because just a week later, they had seen the real deal. Ninov's odd decay mm. chain was only briefly mentioned in the paper. Almost no focus was given to it. At the time, it was easy to forget about. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, it was clear that Ninov had attempted to fake element 112 too. Sigurd wow. went back and looked at the okay. raw data files. The raw files only showed radioactive background noise. But on Ninov's computer, these old files had been manually altered, individual numbers had been changed. It was sloppy. Following the advice of his boss, Sigurd went back even further. Again, he found a single decay chain for element 110 that had been produced by Ninov. It was manipulated in the same way. Yeah, again, I keep burying the lead here. Ninov had attempted to fake five new elements. Crazy. So, not only man tried to fake an element, man, he tried to fake five elements. Of all the elements that Ninov's name is attached to, the only one with zero evidence of any wrongdoing is 111. The only reason Ninov got away with his f <laughs> That's crazy two fakes was because his team had found the real thing soon after. They ended up publishing a follow-up okay, yeah. work for elements 110 to 112, where they said, in two cases, we found inconsistency in the data, which led to the conclusion that for reasons not yet known to us, part of the data used for establishing these two chains were spuriously created. Reasons not yet known to us. <sighs> yeah. They did not mention Ninov, but the implication was clear. They were not hit nearly as bad as Berkeley, but it still did lasting damage. Exactly how much damage is hard to say. When GSI requested permission to begin searching for elements as high as 126, higher-ups rejected the proposal. As Kit Chapman says in the book Super Heavy, I've seen the internal report. However, it would be misleading and disrespectful to everyone involved to say that the Ninov fraud was the only reason that GSI okay. fell behind in the element race. The truth is far more complicated. Let's take stock of what we know up to this point. First, we have the element race as a whole. A high wow, just look at this tableau of what he shows and how he organizes everything. Uh, I, again, I, this, is, this is fascinating, this presentation, and it, it really draws you in. Competitive and volatile field of study, which is prone to labs doing sloppy work just to have first dibs on an element. Secondly, Berkeley a once-dominant, highly respected institution who hasn't had a victory in over 25 years, and thus is even more desperate for a win. Third, they've just poached a young up-and-comer in the field from a rival lab with his name already tied to three elements. He is widely considered to be the field's next superstar, and he's brought over a custom software program that only he knows how to use. I can see why they made the mistake, well, I'm going to say mistake of bringing him over that they did. Yeah, everything looked good at the time. All of this is a recipe for disaster. 
It's impossible to talk about the Ninov fraud without also touching on the other major physics fraud from that same year. Jan Hendrik Schoen was similarly fired from Bell Labs for faking years worth of data on organic semiconductors. Ew. It was these two high profile frauds together in such short succession that forced the American Physical Society to revise its guidelines on research misconduct. No one had ever expected someone to be so brazen as to fake data in such a public way until now. Moving forward, co-authors have the responsibility to vouch for the work of their colleagues, not simply defer culpability because they had no direct involvement. In both cases, the fraud occurred because of a single weak link. What I find interesting is how these two cases diverge. Although his exact motive was unclear, there is a reasonable argument you can make that Schoen was pushed to fake data in order to keep his job during an economic collapse. And those lies snowballed until he couldn't cover his tracks anymore. Mm. Ninov does not have a similar motive. Again, much like Schoen, some suspect that Ninov was trying to get ahead of Berkeley's rivals by planting his flag on a discovery he thought was a safe bet. Someone was bound to discover it for real sooner rather than later. If he was really taking a gamble, he severely underestimated just how bad the odds were. It's interesting because, yeah, it's that whole, uh, to go with gambling, he has a bit of a hot hands fallacy going on because it already worked a few times earlier that he kind of got ahead of the thing before the element actually got discovered for real, but this one's a bit more difficult. And as you get heavier and heavier with these super heavies and the odds of actually making these element 118s and all the things just get even crazier and crazier, even more expensive for that matter, then yeah, looks like a, looks like a classic hot hands fallacy with gambling. Al Giorso said it best. Why he did it, I don't know. It's a real mystery. There was nothing for him to gain, absolutely nothing, and everything to yeah. lose. He was almost glad that his good friend Seaborg had already passed away at this point. He would have been one of the co-authors. This would have just about killed him. Wow. Viktor Ninov no longer works in physics. Since being dismissed from Berkeley, he briefly worked as a professor of physics at University of the Pacific. But since 2006, he has held a variety of engineering positions at a few different California companies. He is now in his 60s. Viktor Ninov's exact motives will almost certainly remain a mystery. So with that in mind, I present to you this admittedly far-fetched theory, provided by his old boss at GSI, Sigurd Hoffman. Okay. Sigurd double-checked the dates when Ninov first made his false claims. Ninov claimed that he saw element 110 on November 11th, and it had a half-life of 11.19 minutes. On its own, it's a little odd that 11 would appear so much here. But <laughs> yeah. consider the fact that German carnivals commonly start on November 11th at 11 a.m., coinciding with Armistice Day. 11, 11, 11. That Ninov meant it as a joke, a taunt. I admit it's weak on its own, but Element 118, Ninov's other fake, was announced on April 19th, Glenn Seaborg's birthday. Wow. Maybe we're looking for a pattern where there is none. Two data points, it's kind of hard to make a pattern. The only labs that survived the Ninov scandal completely untarnished were Dubna and Livermore. The same year that Ninov was fired, Dubna and Livermore had jointly announced sightings of elements 116 and 118, alongside their still unconfirmed 114. The next year, they made a claim for 115, too. Alongside that, 113 was thought to be a possible alpha decay product. This was a partnership that seemed impossible just 20 years earlier, but a Russian-American collaboration was bulldozing everyone else. Of course, Berkeley and GSI weren't just going to roll over and accept this new state of affairs, right? The Livermore group found themselves at a conference in 2009 in Salt Lake City. Unexpectedly, they were approached by a researcher who told them, here's some data, hot off the press, no one has seen it. We've just confirmed your discovery of 114. That researcher was Ken Gregorich. After the crushing embarrassment of the Ninov fraud, Berkeley had put the scientific community first. IUPAC confirmed 114 that's good. That's that's good to say. In 116 in 2012, the names honored the California city of Livermore and Georgi Flerov, the man who had started Russia's element hunt in the first place. The two sides of the Transfermium Wars were officially partners. 
But as it goes, a new challenger eventually emerged to fill the vacuum left by Berkeley and GSI, the Raiken Institute in Japan. Raiken's accelerator was top of the line and they didn't have to compete for beam time like the other major labs. After a decade-long stalemate, Japan just barely eked out the discovery for element 113. Although my understanding is that this is a very controversial ruling. The Cold War was over, yes, but new rivalries will always be around. Mm. On the flip side, however, Dubna did get credit for 118, 115, and 117. Al Giorso, who passed away in 2010 at the age of 95, never got an element named after him. In the end, element 118 was named after Yuri Oganesian, who has been, and still is, the director of the Dubna Lab for almost as long as the Berlin Wall has been torn down. Wow. He is now only the second living person to have an element named after him, joining Glenn Seaborg in their elite little club. Element 118 marks the end of the seventh and, to date, final row of the periodic table. There is almost certainly an eighth row to the table. Right now, the first claim to that row looks like it belongs to either Dubna Livermore or Riken. 119 and 120, when they're found, hopefully within the next five years, will start that new row. There are a few different recipes being tried out. Riken wants to try vanadium and curium. Dubna Livermore wants to try titanium fired at berkelium. That's when you get even crazy. So you have these already artificial things, and now we're going to start shooting more things. And uh, these already pretty heavy uh, transuranic elements, and now we're hitting them with even more to, to, get to, to get to 119. That's, wow. And to think back in the day, trying to get plutonium was hard. None of these are particularly easy to make a beam for. Calcium-48 is by and large the best material to use for beams, but that would require a target of Einsteinium to make 119, and that that's expensive. There's even an ambitious plan to swap the concept yeah. of the beam and the target. Make medium-sized iron the target, and make ultra-heavy plutonium the beam. Plutonium beam! Point, nothing is too crazy to rule out completely. <laughs> In all likelihood, when 119 and 120 are found, they'll belong here. After that, though, no one really knows what's going to happen. Maybe we'll need a third row, completely detached from the rest of the table. Going by the Magic Island theory, element 126 is supposed to be extra stable. Past that, some people say it should be possible to go up to 172, maybe even 173. Do these even wow. mean anything for real-life chemistry? Probably not. As we've learned more and more <laughs> about the elements up to 118, we've noticed that the traditional chemistry starts to break down. Whereas before an element's behavior could be reasonably predicted by the shape of its electron orbitals, by the time you have 118 protons, those electron orbitals just kind of look like a blob. You might ask why we spend so much time and money- Yeah, that, that, much, of, that much of a positive charge and a whole, a whole mess of neutrons that try to dilute them, there's a reason why they're not that stable. And yeah, when you look at anything below the, uh, the nucleus, <laughs> who knows? experiments that have been reaching the point of diminishing returns for decades. I could tell you that, well, some of these elements are used in radiation therapy for cancer treatment and have saved millions of lives. I could tell you that some of these elements may be used to improve the efficiency of future nuclear reactors. However, the vast majority are not so useful. They will only ever exist for a fraction of a fraction of a second. But you know by now that utility was never the point. It's like when you're a kid and you try and see how tall you can build a tower of Lego blocks before it topples over. We do it, because why not? And there's still maybe some advances in the future that use more and more, more of it. Sometimes There may be some things when you only need stuff to exist for that long, or you could somehow, I don't know, make that, make that be part of how your system works, but who knows? Yeah, I, I have no idea how to use these super heavies either. <laughs> These ones that exist for fractions of a second, and it costs billions of dollars to make one of. It's kind of a bit like uh, like antimatter being super, super expensive, but maybe at one point we'll figure out a better use for it. That was fascinating. Again, I, I just find it baffling with someone who with very little to gain, because it's not like he was going to get the, the element named after him, but maybe it was just one of his quirks, because he mentioned about all of his crazy Bulgarian type uh, hog hobbies or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah. Who really knows the, uh, the motive for trying to, trying to fake and falsify documents and that sort of thing for really no, really no uh, financial or 
reputation gain or whatever. Could have just it could have been all in his mind. Who knows? It's a shame though, because he could have been brilliant. Made a lot of contributions to physics. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.